Wir kommen zu dem letzten interessanten Punkt auf unserer Konferenz heute. Bevor ich aber Professor Moody ankündige, will ich noch sagen, dass wir nach der Keynote die Möglichkeit haben, hier noch beieinander zu stehen, zu reden. Ich komme ja aus dem Land der Frühaufsteher, da muss man durch, man muss mit dem Slogan einfach irgendwie leben. Insofern bin ich ja schon mal ganz froh, dass wir erst um elf angefangen haben. Aber wir haben gedacht, okay, es gibt vielleicht für euch ganz netten Unstrutwein, gerade sind die Weinfeste oder Winzerfeste ohne Ende bei uns. Und dann entsprechend auch was zu essen oder eben das sogenannte Klasse Röder. Wie auch immer, also ihr seid gerne eingeladen, nach, dem, nach der Keynote hier noch ein bisschen zu bleiben und mit uns zu reden oder euch untereinander zu vernetzen und zwar ganz unmittelbar. Also, Glenn Moody, Glenn Moody ist Autor, Blogger und hält weltweit Vorträge. Er schreibt in großen internationalen Zeitungen, Zeitschriften, in Magazinen, analog und online. Er schreibt regelmäßig über digitale Rechte, über das Urheberrecht und über Patente für das Technologiemagazin TechDirt.com und sein persönlicher Hauptblog, da muss ich jetzt vorsichtig sein, open.blogspot.com, ähm, dagegen fokussiert allerdings auf Open Source, Open Content und Open Culture. Er hat nach seinem Master und seiner Promotion im Fach Mathematik an der Cambridge Universität ähm, Wirtschafts-, mit Wirtschaftsjournalismus angefangen, um sich dann ab 1993 auf Themen rund um den Computer zu spezialisieren. Ähm, zum Internet als Werkzeug in der Wirtschaft schreibt und lehrt und brät Glyn Moody seit 1994 95 begann er mit Open Source erstmal begann er sich erstmals mit Open Source zu beschäftigen und 97 hatte als erster eine über Nerdkreise hinaus bekannt gewordene Reportage über GNU und Linux und freie Software verfasst, die im weltberühmten Wired Magazin veröffentlicht wurde. Seit 2001 ist dann das Buch Rebel Code Linux and Open Source Revolution veröffentlicht worden. Bisher, soweit wir das überschauen, der einzige detaillierte Überblick über die Geschichte freier Software und letztlich 2004 kam von ihm Digital Code of Life ähm, eine Veröffentlichung zu der Frage Bio, der Bedeutung der Bioinformatik und am Beispiel der Genomforschung demonstriert. Soweit vielleicht zu dem jetzt Vortragenden. Ich wünsche euch viel Spaß und dann natürlich auch die Möglichkeit, noch von uns mit eingeräumt Fragen zu stellen. Bitte. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I must apologize for speaking the wrong language here, but I'm sure your English is better than my German. If I'm not clear at any point, please let me know and I'll try and do better. I'm really delighted to be back in Berlin again. Um, although as a Londoner, I'm a bit worried by Berlin's continuing ascent as an important centre for all the things that I write about. It's a, a real rival now. But it's, it's a major player in the story I have to tell this evening, which is about ACTA. Because something uh, amazing happened with this anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which sounds pretty boring. I mean, a trade agreement about counterfeits, um, it's not the kind of thing that people get excited about. Uh, what it was is a group of nations around the world, the United States, the European Union, um, New Zealand, Australia. It was a global treaty uh, nominally about tackling counterfeits. And you might think, well, everyone's in favor of that. And yet, um, on the 4th of July, the European Parliament actually uh, voted against uh, ratifying that treaty by a massive majority, 478 votes against it, 39 in favour and 165 abstentions. And that uh, was really uh, unprecedented. It's the first time the European Parliament had ever rejected a, an international trade agreement negotiated by the European Commission, because normally they just agree to whatever the European Commission has uh, set up. So this was a, an unprecedented move. And it followed uh, six months of equally unprecedented Europe-wide protests on the street. And what made this even more unprecedented was the fact that what people were really protesting about was copyright, which hitherto has been a rather boring, arcane subject, and yet this got people onto the streets. So what I want to do is explore why that happened and what the implications of that are. So first of all, let's look at the origins of copyright, which actually go back to another technology invented here in Germany, uh, at least after the Chinese invented it, which is uh, Gutenberg's movable type of the 15th century. 
And that led to printers obviously springing up. And in England, there was a very interesting situation where you had a group of printers who were called the Stationers Company. And they were given an exclusive and perpetual state monopoly by the Crown. And that only they could print books. And they had a list of books that were allowed to be printed. And no one else could print anything else. And what that was, was an instrument of censorship. It was a very clever move by the English Crown to outsource censorship. Because the stationer's company only printed the books that were in that list. And they weren't going to print anything that got them into trouble. So it was a very clever way of doing that. So that was what the copyright was. It was their right to produce copies of those books. That went on for 100, 150 years. And the first modern copyright law is generally regarded as the English Statute of Anne, which was passed in 1709 uh, and came into force in 1710. It's interesting because it describes itself not as an act of censorship, but as an act for the encouragement of learning. And that's a, a very interesting description. And it was also radical because it gave a limited monopoly, none of this infinite monopoly, but 14 years with a 14 years extension. And that was radical because it meant there was a time after copyright, what we now call a public domain. So that act effectively invented the public domain, which is, as we now know, a crucial part of the whole ecosystem of creativity. Now, one reason I've talked about the Statute of Anne is because it strongly influenced the American tradition, and as we now know, the American copyright lobbyists, essentially, are driving what's happening around the world, including ACTA and many other things. So let's just quickly look at what happened there. The Ameri first American Copyright Act was in 1780. Again, it had the 28 years that the British one had, but that didn't last very long. In 1834, they made the term of copyright 42 years. 1909, it went up to 56 years. It was going up to 14 years at a time. The big jump was in 1976, when it became copyright lasted for the life of the creator, plus 50 years. And then more recently, just 14 years ago, it became life plus 70 years. And if you think what that means, imagine somebody writing a book when she's 30. She's going to live to roughly 80, that's 50 years. Then there's another 70 years of copyright after that. So that means copyright, on average, for a typical kind of lifespan, for a typical artist, will last for 120 years. The first copyright lasted for 14 years. So we've moved on from that 14 years to 120 years, uh, an extraordinarily big difference. Also, copyright has been extended. It's been extended to art, music, architecture, and new forms like films, TV, and software as they've come through. So what started out as a very tiny, specific solution to a tiny problem has now widened immensely. Something else happened. Gutenberg 2.0, the internet. I just want to run through some of the things that have happened in the last 20 years of the internet. So here are some figures that I found around the internet. There are roughly 100 million blogs. If you add up the pictures on Flickr and Instagram, there's roughly 7 billion of them, 7 or 8 billion. YouTube won't say how many videos it's got, but it does say it's got hundreds of millions. It also admits that every minute, 72 hours of videos are uploaded, which gives you an idea of how fast it's growing. Facebook, we know, is approaching roughly 1 billion users, not all active users, but it's still a big number. And there's a nice statistic that apparently there are roughly 1 trillion web pages. Now, what do these all have in common? Well, they're all about sharing. These are all things that people put on the internet for other people to look at. They don't put them there to be hidden. They are there for other people to look at and interact with. And this really is the great revolution that the internet, and particularly the web, has brought about. It's turned ordinary people into creators and recreators, because a lot of it is based on existing material. When you're sending something you found interesting in the newspaper, or an image that you found, or a mashup of some kind. And that's led to this tremendous explosion of creativity. Unfortunately, a lot of it, as I say, is based on existing material. And the publishers aren't very happy about that because they have been the gatekeepers. They have been the ones that said what you could do with this stuff. The internet has stopped that. So they fought back. They brought in, as we know, digital rights management, or the even better German version, Digitale Rechte Minderung, because that's what it is. It's taking away rights. That failed because it was a technical solution, and technical solutions can always be hacked around. So what do they do? Okay, they turned from software code to legal code. They got their lobbyists busy, and they got new laws passed which say, well, okay, you may be clever enough to break DRM, but if you do, then we're going to put you in prison, or fine you at least. 
And so the, in America, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed, which made it illegal to circumvent DRM. It also introduced this concept of takedown notices. The idea here was that if a copyright owner thought that a site were holding uh, something that belonged to it, and it was purely based on accusation, you didn't have to prove it, they could demand that that be taken down or there'd be consequences in terms of liability. Europe has its own European Copyright Directive, which came, out in came through in 2001. The DMCA and the European Copyright Directive are both results of a treaty. And it's a good example of what ACTA is about. ACTA is a treaty. It's not a law. It's a treaty that will lead to laws. And the treaty uh, led to the DMCA and the European Copyright Directive was the first example of using treaties to force through more stringent and harsher legislation. More recently, um, because the DMCA and the EUCD failed, uh, the lobbyists have been back with the politicians and they came out with SOPA, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. The Stop Online Piracy Act came out at the end of last year. It went even further in this idea of sending notices to websites. In particular, it was going to send notices to payment processors, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and ad services, Google Ads. And again, this was on allegation only, uh, a publisher could send a notice to one of these payment processors and say, this site has our copyright material. Do not let them have any more money. So this was attacking the financial side now. Now that in itself, okay, may have been vaguely reasonable, but the, the other part wasn't, because it also attacked sites that, and I have to quote this, allegedly are taking or have taken steps to avoid confirming a high probability of infringement. And if that doesn't really mean anything, it doesn't mean much to me either, but it's a badly worded way of saying that if a site doesn't check everything that is uploaded to that site, they could have their money taken away. And the only way sites could have complied with SOPA would have been 24 by 7 surveillance, which would have meant obviously loss of privacy, freedom of speech. So this is what SOPA was really about. It may have called itself the Stop Online Piracy Act, but it actually meant the Total Surveillance Act. This obviously got people pretty worked up in America, and it led to the unprecedented internet blackout on the 18th of January 2012, when Major sites, Wikipedia, Google, Mozilla, actually had these immense black bars and black pages. But not only that, 115,000 other sites, ordinary websites around the world, joined in. The net community gathered 4.5 million signatures. And perhaps most significantly, the American people sent millions of emails and made millions of phone calls to their politicians who freaked out completely. They had never, ever had this kind of concentrated attack by ordinary people on what they were doing. It's, SOPA suddenly became toxic, and it was dropped, and the sister legislation called PIPA was dropped. Now, it doesn't mean it's dead, it just means you know, it's resting, a bit like the parrot in Monty Python. Um, it, it's probably going to come back in some form, but the point is that attempt to push it through failed because it had bipartisan support at that point. There was nobody against it in the American political system. So there was nothing to stop it except the people, and the people stopped it. The other immensely important effect that those SOPA protests had was they woke up Europe to ACTA, because ACTA, this anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, has been uh, negotiated behind closed doors for four years. I mean, I've been writing about it for at least three years. Other people have too. It's not as if that this was completely unknown, but people weren't aware of what it meant. What I quickly want to do is just run through three of the worst aspects of ACTA, why people in Europe suddenly got very upset. One has to do with civil damages, because ACTA uh, allows any legitimate measure of value the right holder submits, and that includes things like the sales value. Now, the idea there is that, for example, if you buy a fake, or if somebody sells, rather, a fake handbag, then they could be fined the value of the real handbag. Now, that in itself is pretty stupid, because when people buy fake handbags, they know they're fake. That's why they buy them, because they can't afford the real thing. So the idea that that fake handbag is in any way a lost sale for the real handbag is ridiculous for a start. But it's even worse in the digital world, because if you think about it, when people download copies of MP3s, they have zero cost. So there is zero barrier to trying things out. So it's not as if people 
said, ah, oh, I'll save 10 euros by downloading this. They just downloaded it because very often they're tasting things. And there's a lot of research to show that people download things to try out stuff and then they go and buy it. It's actually a marketing means. So this civil damages would have allowed the um, music companies and publishers to sue people for very large sums of money because they said, well, look, there's a million copies of my MP3 out there. I'm going to sue you for a million times you know, two euros or something. So that was one aspect. The criminal damages was even worse in many ways because it had this phrase that criminal damages would be available for piracy on a commercial scale. That sounds great, except that it then goes on to define commercial scale as meaning for direct or indirect economic or commercial advantage. And again, on the internet, the problem is this catches a huge number of people. For example, if you've got a little website where people can upload files and where you have some Google ads and somebody uploads um, a copyright file in an unauthorized way, you're probably going to get more traffic as people find out about that. So you'll get more money from the Google ads. So you will have indirect economic advantage. So great, you know, go to jail. ACTA says that you have uh, infringed and have indirect economic advantage. Therefore, criminal damages are available. So this incredible overreach of uh, criminal damages. And then there was one chapter specifically about the digital world, which managed to be even worse than the other two. And it had this very innocuous phrase calling for the cooperative efforts between the copyright industries and the internet world. And again, you might think, well, that sounds reasonable. You know, what's, what's wrong with that? Uh, and indeed, it actually said, and of course, you've got to preserve fair pro pro uh, process and privacy. And again, you think, well, that's fantastic. They're even worried about the kind of civil rights issues. The problem is fair process doesn't exist as a legal concept. Uh, you can have uh, due process or you can have fair trials, but fair process doesn't exist. So you have two possibilities. You had the negotiations of ACTA consisting of roomfuls of highly paid lawyers who for four years used this phrase, uh, fair process, and just overlooked the fact that it didn't mean anything. Or you have roomfuls of lawyers for four years who intentionally used language that gave the appearance of safeguarding civil liberties, but intentionally and in bad faith did not. And I know which one I vote for. Uh, it also talks about preserving privacy, and then the next line says, oh, by the way, of course, you have to identify a subscriber that allegedly infringes. So I'm not quite sure how you preserve privacy when you go around identifying subscribers. So the digital chapter was a, was a real disaster in terms of civil rights. So, not surprisingly, people got upset. Interestingly, the first protests which took place in Poland were eight days after the blackout uh, for SOPA. So I think there's a fairly clear causal relationship there. The street protests in Poland, particularly impressive, as I'm sure many people here will realize, because on the 26th of January, it's pretty cold in Poland, like minus 10 or something. And yet, thousands and thousands of people took to the streets for hours in minus 10 degrees. And they were complaining about these copyright uh, clauses in an obscure counterfeiting treaty, which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, interesting question is why it happened in Poland. I've heard two theories about that. One is that uh, in Poland there has been more downloading of uh, unauthorized versions of files. Uh, the reason for that being there are no authorized versions they could download because people haven't bothered opening up digital services in Poland because they don't think it's important enough, so they didn't have any choice. The other one, also very interesting, is that obviously Poland lived under the Soviet Empire for 30 or 40 years. There are strong memories there of what surveillance means, what loss of privacy means. And so I think, you know, whichever there may be a combination of those factors, but Poland responded to that threat. And thereafter, the rest of Europe really woke up. There were Europe-wide demonstrations on the 11th of February. And this is the point really where I think Germany um, and Berlin in particular, not least because of uh, Netzpolitik, um, really took the lead. Uh, and so it's to Germany's credit that things really got going in terms of getting people onto the street as these kind of numbers, which uh, are the best I can find in terms of what happened around Europe. But very large numbers of people took to the streets, again, protesting about copyright in an anti-counterfeiting treaty, which is, is really just extraordinary. And of course, you know, the politicians noticed. I mean, it's the one thing that politicians take note of is when people actually get out of their houses and do something. And so the political dominoes started to fall. Um, 
you first of all had a few countries saying, well, maybe we won't ratify, and then you had the political parties within the European Parliament starting to say, well, actually, we recommend voting against it. And then finally, you had David Martin, who was the rapporteur on ACTA, making a recommendation to the entire European Parliament saying, I think this is a bad treaty, vote against it, largely for the reasons I've mentioned. And as we saw, they did. So this was an extraordinary sequence of events. So what was going on there? Well, this is part of the great digital lockdown. We've seen that um, over the years, over the last 15 or 20 years, more and more harsher and harsher punishments have been brought in for sharing digital files. Um, and allegedly, I mean, it's a really important point, a lot of this was not about people who had been proved to have done this, but just alleged. And what's happening is that it seems that no price is too high to stop people sharing. So if you want to get rid of that presumption of innocence and go for presumption of guilt, that seems to be okay. Uh, as I mentioned, the criminal sanctions for trivial infringement were extreme. You, know, you could go to prison for, for just sharing uh, a few files. One of the early drafts of ACTA, which leaked out, actually had the three strikes in it. And if you think about it, that's collective punishment. That's saying a family will be cut off from the internet because one person is accused of downloading files. And the Geneva Convention actually forbids collective punishment, but it seems that when you're trying to stop sharing, that's okay. You know, it's a bit like cutting off somebody's water supply because they've made a few bottles of illegal alcohol. I mean, you know, how have we got to this point? It's extraordinary, but it seems that when it's fighting sharing, that's fine. But this is an unwinnable arms race. I said before, the DMCA, EUCD were brought in to address the problem of people breaking DRM. That didn't work. So they brought in SOPA, an actor, to address the problems with the DMCA and EUCD by going for the payment processors. Well, that didn't work either. They're still trying, there's something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which some of you may have heard of, TPP, which is mainly the Pacific Rim, but is really ACTA 2.0. It's even worse than ACTA. An example, when you use the internet, when you look at a website, you're downloading a copy of that website onto your computer. TPP would actually make that a copyright infringement. They are so keen to stamp out any copies, that includes the copies of the internet. So the idea presumably would be you'd have to get a license to download a web page because otherwise it would be copyright infringement. I mean, it's, it's just deranged. And it shows that it is really against the whole idea of sharing. But the problem is actually even more fundamental. I mean, let's suppose they win. Let's suppose they actually stop all online sharing. That isn't actually going to stop sharing. Why? Because of Moore's Law. I'm sure, again, many of you know this, this, the idea that we've seen over the last 30 years that technology just keeps getting better. For the same price, you can get double the computing power after 18 months or double the storage power. I mean, cars don't do this. Your car doesn't get twice as fast every 18 months. It doesn't get half as expensive. This is a, a key property of the digital world, and it's a hint that we're, we're you know, not in Kansas anymore. This is a different situation. There's a very interesting demonstration that Google recently put on their blog. Um, it's very hard to get, get an idea of what this 18-month business means. You think, well, that's fine, it doubles, so what? But this is cumulative, right? So they said, well, let's look at the total computing power of the 1960s Apollo missions. And when I say total, I mean the onboard computers and all of the on-the-ground computers for all of the missions. Okay? I mean, that's like 10 years of computing. That's, you know, a lot. And they calculated it, and they said, well, what is that in modern-day terms? And they said, oh, look, it equals one Google search. Okay? So the entire computing capacity of the 1960s to get people to the moon, you do 100 times a day, a billion people do 100 times a day. That is what Moore's Law means. However, let's look at how it applies to the situation we're talking about. Yesterday, I went on Amazon, and I thought, well, how much would I have to pay for a portable hard disk. And in fact, it turns out you can get a three terabyte hard disk, uh, one that plugs into USB ports about that big, for 110 euros. Now, three terabytes, well, that's 3,000 gigabytes or three million megabytes. That's about a million MP3 songs on one hard disk. So, you know, this gives a new meaning to the idea of partying hard. You go along to your party with your hard disk and you plug it into the host's computer swap a few hundred thousand songs and you go home with your new few hundred thousand songs. This is happening. This has been happening for years, but 
Now, it's not swapping 10 songs. It's not swapping 1,000 songs. You can swap a million songs. This is what Moore's Law means. It just keeps getting more and more, so to speak. OK, let's look at the laws around the sharing. Poor Jamie Thomas, uh, a mother of four in America, uh, was fined $222,000 for sharing 24 songs. In 2009, poor Joel Tannenbaum, who's still fighting this unbelievably, uh, was fined $675,000 for sharing 30 songs. That's $20,000 per song. And he was lucky. She was lucky because, according to the 1976 US Copyright Act, you can be fined $150,000 per copyright infringement. That's per song. Well, what about those parties in America where people are taking their three terabyte hard disks? Well, that means you could face a fine of $150 billion, roughly 5% of Germany's GDP. So, you know, you're in big trouble in America. Uh, you may laugh and say, yeah, well, that's these silly young people sharing stuff. They shouldn't do that. John Terranian is an a American law professor, and in 2007, he published a rather nice paper called Infringement Nation, Copyright Reform and the Law Norm Gap. You can find it online for free, of course. And he looks at an ordinary day in the life of a hypothetical law professor named by complete coincidence, John. And he looks at doing things like you know, opening your email, downloading a you know, picture or two, forwarding stuff to your colleagues, you know, the kind of things that we all do every day. And he worked out what the theoretical liability is. And for those everyday acts, it's $4.5 billion per year that we all owe to the copyright holders, according to the strict interpretation of copyright law. Okay, so this isn't people downloading millions of songs. This is you and me using email and the web every day. Well, let's look at tomorrow. You think it's bad now. Three years' time, Moore's Law says that you'll be able to get 10 million MP3s on that same hard disk. A few years' time after that, you'll get every song ever recorded on that hard disk. Uh, Spotify has around 15, 16 million. I think there are probably 50, 100 million songs, maybe. But it'll all fit on a single hard disk. After that, you get every film on that hard disk. Until finally, you have a hard disk that has every artifact that's ever been digitalized. And this is Moore's law. And this is coming. And this is what the, the people that make laws, like SOPA and ACTA, do not understand, because they are still fighting the battles of the 1990s. Oh, by the way, it's going to get worse, because you get 3D printers. Then you start printing chairs, OK? And then things really get interesting, but we won't go there. <laughs> OK, think about it. The basic modern copyright law, the Statute of Anne, is 300 years old. And copyright law since then has moved in one direction and in one direction only. It's got longer, it's got stronger, it's got stricter, and it's got broader. You do not hear of politicians standing up and saying, we must reduce the term of copyright. They're always saying it must be longer. Interestingly, they never give any reasons for this. They just say it must. And it is. It's happened. Why has that happened? Well, because in an analog world, it doesn't really matter. When you had books, there's not much you can do with it unless you have a printing press in your cellar. You can't make copies. So who cares if copyright is 10 years or 50 years? You're not going to do anything anyway. And similarly with you know, books, uh, similarly with pictures, you, know, you can't copy a picture. In the digital world, everyone using a computer, everyone using a tablet, everyone using a mobile phone is implicated in copyright every second. So we've gone from an analog world where copyright was essentially irrelevant to a digital world where copyright touches everything we do in a modern way. This, as you appreciate, is a major transition. But surprisingly, it's not what you would describe as a once-in-a-lifetime transition. This is a once-in-a-civilization transition. It's never happened before. And it'll never happen again. So congratulations. You are living through one of the key transitions in history. You can tell your grandchildren about it. Because the only way we go through this transition again is if civilization crashes and burns and we go back to doing things in caves and then we have to reinvent it all. Provided that doesn't happen, and of course there's a fairly good probability it will happen, but anyway. Provided that doesn't happen, we stay in a digital world, which means we don't have this transition. Oh, by the way, this also applies to alien civilizations. They also have the same problem, so we have a lot in common with aliens as well. The point is, this once-in-a-civilization transition is, is amazing. I mean, we are privileged, but it's also problematic because the laws have to change. You have to recognize that the analog and digital worlds 
are different. An analog artifact, a chair, a book, is not the same as a sequence of zeros and ones, which is what all digital artifacts are. All digital artifacts are the same. They're just numbers, okay? Um, that's the ridiculous thing about copyrights. When you have di digital artifacts, you're copywriting a number, which seems strange. So copyright really needs to be different for these two worlds. And what we need is a public debate about really the, the form of digital copyright, because you could argue that analog copyright has been honed over 300 years, you know, maybe that's sorted. Um, some of us might differ, but anyway. Let's just concentrate on the digital side of things. And really, it was the lack of that public debate, I think, that led to the anti-ACTA protests, because ACTA was negotiated behind closed doors, uh, contrary to what some people were saying earlier this afternoon. There were four meetings in Brussels over four years, and that constituted the full extent of the European Commission's uh, debate with the public. MEPs were not allowed to look at ACTA unless they signed a non-disclosure agreement saying they wouldn't tell anyone what was in it. That is not <coughs> transparency, uh, in my view. So I think when people woke up to ACTA and realized that they hadn't been allowed to even know what was in it, they got pretty angry. And really, we need now that debate about the future of copyright. Now, one of the interesting things about those people on the streets was they weren't really there as left-wing people or right-wing people. They were there because they were against ACTA. They were against the kind of things that ACTA was trying to do. And indeed, that same kind of confusion about where left-wing and right-wing stand on copyright is also true of the main parties. If you think the three strikes Adopi in France was brought in by Nicolas Sarkozy and his right-wing government, whereas the Digital Economy Act in the UK was brought in by a left-wing government. So there is no clear line between one group, left and right, and where they stand on copyright, for example. It's a very confused situation because it doesn't really stand on this kind of spectrum, left to right. Really, what we're looking at now is a, a scarcity abundance spectrum, and it's where parties stand on that scarcity abundance spectrum, as well as the left-wing one. So it's a kind of two-dimensional political situation now. So what I want to do is look at scarcity and abundance politics just quickly to conclude. The earliest scarcity politics party was the United Tasmania Group, believe it or not, and also the Values Party of New Zealand, who were unusual because they campaigned on a single um, platform around an ecological issue in Tasmania and New Zealand. And that was the, the start of the Green Party. Um, 1973, the, Green, uh, the UK People Party apparently started. And then in the 1980s, the German Greens really started to make the Green Party, uh, if you like, a kind of complete, broad political movement because they moved on from being a single issue grouping just about ecology to one that actually could engage with the mainstream parties to form coalitions. And I think Germany has really led the way in that. But nonetheless, the Greens' policy is, the central theme is scarcity. It's about the scarcity of natural resources. And what they've done a fantastic job of over the last few years is making people aware of what, what economists call negative externalities of abundance. A negative externality is, you like, the kind of hidden cost. If you imagine a factory, when a factory makes things, there is the costs of the raw materials and such like. But there's also the hidden cost of the pollution they cause. When they chuck things into the atmosphere or when they chuck things into the sea, they don't pay for that. We pay for that. So it's a socialized cost. So that's a negative externality of treating the air and the water as abundant. And in fact, that's one of the key things I think the Greens have made people aware of, that pollution of the physical sphere, like air and water and land, being treated as infinite dumping grounds. But we know that big as it is, the earth is actually finite and that it's you know, filling up with junk. Even the sea is just full of junk. The other side of that is the over-exploitation as if things were abundant. People have treated fish stocks as if you can just keep taking stuff from them. People have treated the forests as, as if they were infinite. You just keep cutting them down and magically they'll come back. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work. Okay, so let's look at abundance politics. Again, like the Greens, it started out as a very local movement, the Swedish Pirate Party in 2006, that was tackling quite local things. And then that's gradually broadened out, culminating again in Germany with the Piratenpartei wins in the state elections which is probably the, the, the most high-profile win so far. 
And again, what we're seeing now is an attempt, a slightly painful one, to move on from the single issues to something that can join mainstream parties in coalitions. And because this is a much younger movement, that still hasn't been achieved yet. So you've got the interesting questions of what will come out of that. And just as the Greens base their policy around the central theme of scarcity, so the, the Pirate Party is really based around the central theme of abundance, but of digital resources. And you can frame it rather interesting, I think, that what they've done is they've raised the awareness of the negative externalities of scarcity. What I mean by that is the copyright industry tries to convince us that a digital artifact, an MP3 file or a digital book, is scarce and therefore should be treated like a scarce object with scarce pricing. But we know, and young people certainly know, that it's not scarce. You can make you know, a billion copies for almost zero cost. So these are abundant goods, but we treat them as if they were scarce. And indeed, the whole basis of SOPA and ACTRA is trying to enforce scarcity where there is really abundance. And the negative externalities are really serious, and people are only just waking up to them. For example, what I've called the pollution, a bit like the physical pollution of the ethical sphere, we are treating copyright monopoly as being more important than basic freedoms, which is a really extraordinary situation and I think you know, compares to the idea that you can just pollute the sea and it doesn't really matter. Similarly, we're now polluting the ethical sphere, saying, well, so what if we have surveillance or so what if you know, people lose these basic rights? At least we're you know, preserving scarcity. Probably even more important than that, just like the over-exploitation of fish stocks leads to collapse, so the under-exploitation of digital resources is a huge loss. Let me give some practical examples. There has been uh, an attempt to bring in a treaty for the blind which would give them an exception to copyright that would let them take a book and produce, for example, a Braille version of that. This attempt has been going for 30 years. It's still going on and it's still being blocked. It's being blocked by the US and by the European Union to its shame. And the reason it's being blocked is because the publishers fear that if you create any exception to copyright, it might give people ideas. So never mind that the blind have access to 5% of the books that sighted people have. Never mind about the blind, they don't really matter. What's important is preserving scarcity. And the blind treaty, lack of, is a good example of how blind people are paying for this insistence that scarcity must be preserved at all costs. Just two days ago, the European Parliament agreed to a directive on orphan works. Orphan works, as you probably know, are copyright works that you can't find the owner for. If you can't find the owner, you can't find the person to ask permission for. So you can't do anything with it. You can't digitize it. Nothing. So there's been long discussions about, well, how about if we made it a bit easier to use this, like if libraries or museums have material that's still in copyright, but they can't do anything with. And finally, a directive was passed uh, two days ago, and it is a complete and utter disgrace because it was neutered as it went through the European Parliament by certain MEPs who managed to take out any of the useful parts of it and left it such that it's almost worse than the situation before. And the reason they did that is because the copyright industry is worried about something bad happening to copyright if people are allowed exceptions. So there's two very concrete things that happened recently. But the biggest one is the one that probably most people don't even know is there about the under-exploitation of these resources. And that is that we could give all human knowledge to everybody on this planet with, an ac with access to the internet or to a mobile phone. And since mobile phones cost about $10 in India these days, that's effectively going to be everyone in about five years' time. We could give access to everything we know to those people. We don't do that because the publishers want to preserve scarcities. Now, if you think about what we're losing in terms of this under-exploitation, out there, there are 100 Goethe's. Out there, there are 100 Einsteins, and there are 100 Beethoven's. None of them will ever realize their potential because they don't have access to the things they need. They may get minimal education if they're lucky, but they certainly won't have access to things that we have because we can afford to pay what the publishers demand. But I would submit that the loss to the world of those 100 Einsteins and 100 Beethoven's and 100 Goethe's and all the engineers that could solve you know, the problems of energy or of pollution is an insane price to pay for maintaining scarcity. And this really is the price that we are paying for the, the, the current battles that are going on. So to conclude, what's interesting, I think, 
about the, the Green Parties and the new movements, I mean, it's not just the pirates. I mean, I was looking at the Die Linke uh, brief, leaflet outside, and Die Linke is saying a lot of the things I've been describing here as well, is that the world is seen as a commons, something we heard about this morning, um, that it's something belonging to and managed by a community for the benefit of a community. And that changes how you address things. It means you, you don't do the same things that you do when you regard things as private property or belong, uh, belonging to the state. And so abundance politics, the politics of digital abundance, in some ways not only parallels the scarcity politics of the Greens, but it completes it because it's the other side of the coin. So. I wonder whether you know, we'll start to see a formation around the idea of the Commons. Already in September 2011, the, the Greens in the European Parliament announced that they would adopt the, the Pirate Party's position on copyright. And I think that's a very interesting move because it's, again, this complementarity. It's the digital abundance meeting up with the kind of analog scarcity. And so, you know, perhaps looking to the future, more people will start to think in those terms. It's not about left and right, but it's about abundance and scarcity and how we deal with those, perhaps through the commons idea, which is the third way. And I, last year, or rather when I was at uh, Republica, I described uh, Berlin as the epicenter of the uh, rejection of, of actor in Europe. Um, you know, Germany has led the way with the rise of, of the green movement. Uh, it led the way with the Piratenpartei and with the rejection of ACTA. So, you know, I wonder whether it could lead the way again, uh, discussing this kind of third way uh, forward beyond the current forms of politics, drawing on what we now know about commons, drawing on an understanding of the importance of both scarcity and abundance. Obviously, you know, I don't know, people in this room probably have a better idea. People in this room may even make it happen. But um, I look forward to finding out anyway. So, thank you very much. Um, you were saying that uh, information um, should belong and uh, should be managed by the public, but uh, the truth is right now uh, they are, they are uh, belonging and managed by a few companies, saying Google, Facebook, Amazon and others, and um, uh, how would you react to this? Um? Well, it's a question of, of you know, where they get their power from, and the power comes through copyright. Uh, if you didn't have copyright, they wouldn't have any power. Well, I'll expand on that. Um, basically, what I'm saying is that you need to address those imbalances by changing copyright. Now, we've already had one suggestion that maybe you need to make a distinction between commercial and non-commercial usage. Another distinction you could make is between digital and analog, or you might just want to abolish it completely. But, I mean, that's, that's what has to be addressed, because copyright was an 18th century solution to an 18th century problem. Remember it said it was for the encouragement of learning. Why did they say that? Because they wanted people to write books. And they wanted to come up with a structure that people wrote books and somebody published them. We don't have that problem. If you look, as I said, there are hundreds of millions of people, billions of people creating online now. We don't have the barriers that existed in 1710 that need to be overcome. So in effect, the internet has replaced copyright. Copyright was a means to encourage production. The internet now encourages production. So we need to address the fact that copyright isn't doing or isn't necessary for the job that it was designed to do 300 years ago and is now getting in the way with these negative externalities. Uh, the question was about uh, information monopolies, uh, Google, Facebook, etc. You said uh, they base their power on copyright. Now, isn't Google an anti-copyright company? Aren't they? Uh, isn't isn't their business model, the structures they're building, exactly based on the fact that they can get access to works in or out of copyright, whatever? Then they make private contracts, for example, with libraries uh, whose um, public domain stock they digitize and the contract says yes the library you get one copy but you mustn't use it uh, for any meaningful purpose so that's not copyright there is a new regime emerging isn't it well i, I mean yes and no i agree with some of what you're saying um, 
I, I don't quite understand this demonization of Google. I mean, I'm no fan of Google, and they're definitely becoming evil, if you know, anyone wondered. But um, they are being set up as the evil company, and that was done in SOPA. In fact, uh, the politicians were trying to represent the SOPA protests as led by Google. Even the anti-actor stuff I've seen described as being led by Google. And this really is a political attempt to find a, a bogeyman saying they're the baddies. Um, I don't think that's true. I, I don't think Google is doing that. I don't think it's capable of doing that. What you're absolutely right uh, about is that they are exploiting the fact that copyright exists to set up these exclusive agreements. In fact, the Google Book Agreement would have been a terrible disaster. It would have given Google a monopoly over basically all books. Um, so I agree that that's a problem, but that's because of copyright. If there weren't copyright, or certainly not in the form we have it, then they, there, there wouldn't be an issue because everybody could digitize books. But it's only because there is that copyright stopping other people digitizing those books that Google then says, well, let's come to some private agreement. So they exploit the fact that there is a blockage. They get round that by you know, private negotiations, which puts them in a prime position. So they're just shrewdly exploiting that situation. In, in this whole discussion about copyright, I uh, miss the argument um, how the creative works, how um, the immaterial goods um, are created by they. They are created by people, mm -hmm. and the people has to be uh, has to be paid sure. to make their uh, life from. Yep. So, what is your proposition if you say okay. if, I if mean, you are skeptical about it's copyright? Obviously, it's a very hot topic. So, thanks for raising. I mean, there are there are lots of issues. One is Let's not forget that most artists don't make much money from their creativity. There's this myth that artists just you know, sit at home creating masterpieces. Most of them have to struggle to survive. So the idea that the system is working for them isn't true. People at the top of the system don't need copyright. Why is that the case? Because if you look at the statistics, the top 30 or 40 uh, pop singers in the world make far more money from tours than they do from their copyright royalties. So for the people at the top and the people at the bottom, it's certainly not working. I mean, the people at the top don't need it. The people at the bottom aren't benefiting from it. You could have some argument about the ones in the middle. What's interesting is that alternative ways are emerging. So, for example, Amanda Palmer just raised 1.3 million from her fans to put together her next album. And I think this idea of paying forward is, is very important because people say, well, how are artists going to survive if people are then copying their works? Well, the answer is you go to the fans and say, well, since you like my work so much, would you mind giving me some money so I can write another one? And you've got to be a pretty stupid fan to say no because if you say no, you're not going to get the next one. And I think there's an implicit assumption that people are stupid and greedy. This is the story which basically the copyright industries have put out, whereby if something is free, people will take it and they won't ever give anything back. That's not my experience of how people are. A small percentage, yes. People are not stupid. They know that if they want their favourite artist to create another fantastic album, that person needs money. So either they then buy the album they've downloaded, which a lot do, or they buy a premium version with all the kind of inserts and holograms, goodness knows what, or they pay forward with crowdsourcing. So we're already seeing a range of possibilities in terms of giving money to artists. In advance, it's actually even better than the current system because they get their advance from the fans. They don't need to go begging to publishers or a record company saying, you know, subsidize me for a year and then I sign this contract. They actually get the money up front. So arguably, it's better than the current system. Noch jemand fragen? Ansonsten, wir treffen uns ja draußen nochmal. Ihr könnt ihn auch draußen nochmal ansprechen und das eine oder andere fragen. Ich sehe jetzt niemanden mehr. Ansonsten bedanke ich mich für den Vortrag. Ich bedanke mich für eure Anwesenheit hier, dass es euch heute Spaß gemacht hat. Hoffe ich, dass es anregend war, die gesamte Konferenz. Und ihr könnt uns jetzt noch richtig schädigen, indem ihr draußen esst und noch was trinkt und euch unterhaltet. Okay, recht schönen Dank. Tschüss. By, by the way, if anybody wants this uh, slide deck, just write me a, this email and you're of course going to have it. It's all public domain. <clears throat>